we already established I have that cup of coffee. <laughs> and this is my first in-person talk since the start of COVID. And I'm strangely nervous, and I talk fast when I get nervous. So if anybody needs me to slow down, let me know. Just say, Kelly, the coffee's hitting. And so, let me pull this back up. And so uh, I cannot think of a better topic to start such an optimistic afternoon than talking about our inherent guilt and shame. Um, hopefully though we can put a fun, optimistic spin on it and um, give you some tools to walk away with. And so first we're gonna learn about me. We're gonna define guilt and shame and resiliency and learn how to build some tools in our toolbox to help us deal with guilt and shame. And so, who am I? I am, luckily I'll read this for you. Um, I'm a pediatric cardiovascular genetic counselor, and you might be wondering, Kelly, you deal with genetics, but hearts, so why are you here? Well, I, as a genetic counselor, am a master's level trained um, advanced practice provider who has specialized training in psychosocial components of rare disease. I have also done research in empathy and I have really um, a special interest in adaptation to rare disease. And um, I think that for most people, unless you've been heavily involved in genetics, it's not clear what the difference between a genetic counselor and a geneticist is. And I am not the doctor. I have, like I said, master's level training. I have not been to medical school. Um, and my training really focused more on the nuances of genetics, of genetic testing, and those psychosocial components. I work very closely with physicians, whether they're endocrinologists, pulmonologists, cardiologists, or geneticists. Geneticists are medically trained. They've been to medical school, they've done a residency, and then a fellowship in genetics. So because of that, they're able to complete physical exams to look for physical characteristics of rare diseases, and they're able to help with medical management. So prescribing medications and things like ordering MRIs or x-rays or anything else our patients might need. So genetic counselors work part of the bigger healthcare team to provide full holistic support for patients. And that's one of the goals of a genetic counselor is to see the patients as a whole, um, to attend to you completely, including how you're adapting to your disorder. And so that's why we're here talking about guilt and shame. Guilt and shame are prevalent in every single person. And it's important for us to stand, understand the nuances between them, but a especially for the rare disease population. So, we're gonna start off on not the most optimistic note, and research has told us that people with rare diseases have certain emotional impacts with those, their disease. They worry more about their family, about their children, and have higher levels of anxiety. Naturally, there's grief when we're diagnosed with a rare disease, and depression that goes along with that, and inherent guilt and shame. But there is good news because there are um, very easy asterisk <laughs> interventions that we can use to help combat guilt and shame, and those same interventions can be used for all of these other emotional impacts. All right. I can get pretty nerdy about some of these things, and so we are gonna go into the differences between guilt and shame, and they are nuanced. Guilt is external. It's an emotional response to something that we did wrong. It's that feeling of responsibility we get, or remorse when we've done something offensive, whether that's real or imagined. Shame is internal. It's that painful emotional feeling that we get when we are wrong. It's arising from the feelings of being dishonorable or broken. Guilt affects somebody's behavior, 
shame affects somebody's identity. And first, let's take a closer look at guilt. And I do not want the message today to come across that guilt is easy. Guilt is not easy. It is not an easy emotion, and there can be pain associated with it. I don't know anybody who enjoys feeling like they've done something wrong. However, guilt doesn't have the same psychological consequences that shame does. Research shows us that guilt overall can actually be beneficial. Um, it provides us with a moral compass. It allows us to have power over our actions by identifying when we've done something wrong so that we can implement positive changes. It can also lead to self-punishing behavior when we feel like we need to punish ourselves for something that we have done wrong and ongoing guilt that is unresolved can become harmful. And that's different than shame. So we learned that the research has shown that it doesn't have the same negative associations or consequences. It's adaptive. It allows our brain to build empathy. It allows for the pro-social behavior of recognizing and correcting our errors. And it gives an innate sense of responsibility. But shame is caustic. It grows deep roots into our identity. It is highly correlated with developing difficulties with interpersonal connections, poor problem solving abilities, mental health concerns, suicidality, and more. So let's explore why shame is so harmful. And most of you probably recognize this name, Dr. Brene Brown, before she got famous from TED Talks, was a shame researcher, and she still is. And in her initial 2006 paper, she has published what to this day is still my favorite definition of shame. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and unworthy of love and belonging. And I think there are some very specific nuances in this definition that allow us to start seeing how shame is so harmful. It's an intensely painful feeling that leads us to feeling that we are unworthy of love. I can think of few feelings worse than feeling like we're unworthy of being loved. Shame has some natural emotional consequences. When we feel shame, we feel trapped. We have expectations in our mind that we are not leading up to. We feel that there is an intrinsic part of ourselves that isn't matching up to what we feel that it should be. It leaves us feeling trapped without a solution. Like we're a big puzzle and we're missing some sort of intrinsic piece. Shame represents a flurry of emotions. When we feel shame, we can feel anger and we can feel judgment and grief and the need to hide away. Those feelings are confusing and overwhelming, and without the right tools, we feel powerless to stop them. When we feel trapped and when we feel powerless, we feel isolated. We feel like we're the only one going through our experience. We get tunnel vision. We don't think like anybody else could possibly be going through something similar. And this is even more prevalent in the rare disease community. We already highlighted multiple times today that it is not common for people to meet somebody with their same rare disorder. That alone can make you feel isolated and when you compound that, those feelings can be overwhelming. Research sometimes differentiates between shame and core shame. Shame being transient experiences and core shame becoming the stories we believe about ourselves. Core shame is the deep underlying sense of being unworthy of love that becomes part of our self-identity, part of the story that we tell ourselves and believe about ourselves. And we see multiple core shame identities in the research. Things that we believe wholeheartedly as part of ourselves. I am bad. I am not lovable. 
I am a failure. From my own anecdotal clinical experience, I've seen multiple core shame identities in my patients. Everything you see on this slide has been said to me verbatim by a patient. I am abnormal. I am genetically flawed. I am a waste of resources. When you are sitting in the room with somebody feeling this, you can feel how painful it is. I can only imagine how much more painful it is to experience it. And I'm sure every single person in this room can relate, not just because you're a rare disease patient, but also for those who are in this room who don't have a rare disease, because you're human and we all experience shame for some reason or another. And I think once we look at these core shame identities, we can start to make the dotted line, the connections between seeing how shame is so caustic. When we start believing these things intrinsically about ourselves, how it can lead to such terrible consequences. And bear with me, we're gonna get a little nerdy for a second and we're gonna talk about how core shame is developed. And um, we're gonna to touch on shame experiences in a minute, um, but when we have shame experiences, the connections in our brain start to prune, and they start to prune away the senses of safety and the pieces of our brain that help in emotional regulation. At the same time, we start activating connections associated with distrust and feelings of not being safe. And so, the more shame experiences we have, the more the, these neural connections are pruned, ultimately leading us into adopting one of these core shame identities. But there's a powerful lesson in this, and that is we can prune our brain. And that idea is called neuroplasticity. The idea that we can, by choosing our thoughts, choosing our actions, whether we're choosing those consciously or unconsciously, we can control our brain's patterns of thoughts. And we'll come back to that later, because that's a pretty powerful concept. So I'll try not to get too, too nerdy about it. When we experience shame, we experience it it's as a web of competing expectations. We receive messages from the moment we're born about who we are supposed to be. This can be based on our gender or sexual identity. It can be based on expectations given our appearance. Do we appear able-bodied? Do we appear disabled? Are we blonde? Are we brunette? It can be based on our roles. Are we a healthcare provider? Are we a patient? Are we a wife, father, mother, husband? All of these things create these expectations. They're enforced from everything from media to film to TV. And this web represents how these expectations come at us from every facet of our life, that it becomes a tangled web of expectations that we cannot meet that lead to shame. We end up feeling stuck, feeling like a failure. Eventually, we start to believe that we are a failure. The web is also an apt metaphor for the emotional consequences of shame. Feeling trapped in the web, isolated like you're the only one in the web, and powerless to get out of the web. And this is all, <laughs> interesting to learn about, um, but I think it hits home a little bit more when we bring it to my own experience that I've seen in clinic. And we're gonna meet some of my patients, Olivia and Malcolm, and for obvious reasons, Pippa, um, I'm gonna be a little bit vague, and those are obviously not their real names. Olivia was told throughout her life that she likely had a genetic disorder. She never got tested. Why? Telling somebody they have a genetic disorder and providing a path to getting that diagnosis are two very different things. She never had a path. Not only that, she was busy. School, 
meeting someone, marriage, and then getting pregnant. It was when she was pregnant that she was told, you absolutely need testing because this is going to change your medical management during this pregnancy dramatically. She tested positive for the condition and immediately went from thinking that she had a low risk typical pregnancy to an incredibly high risk pregnancy with extremely close monitoring and ongoing management. She had prenatal testing on her baby. She found out that she was having a baby boy, but that he also had the genetic disorder. I met with Olivia and Malcolm a week after he was born, and there are a few things better than meeting with a newborn, let me tell you. Um, but Olivia was not doing well, and we're gonna talk through why. We're gonna explore shame through Olivia. Her genetic disorder has several physical characteristics. She always felt expectations and pressure to look differently. She was always acutely aware that she did look different. There's an ongoing expectation from healthcare providers for as long as she could remember. Not only that, but it's an unfortunate reality that sometimes we don't use the most kind of terms. Words like mutation, genetic disease, things that naturally have negative connotations to them. Unfortunately, after her diagnosis, Olivia reached out to an online support group and had some incredibly negative experiences. She was told, how can you be a mother with your condition? You should have never carried your baby to term, and I can't believe you chose to pass this condition onto a child. And I think we should take a moment to think about those statements and what that connotes to a patient. What Olivia is hearing is, People with this condition aren't worthy of living. Your condition gives you the skills to not be a good mother. With all of these, it is no wonder that Olivia developed poor shame identity. I am a bad mother, I am broken, and I am a failure. Olivia developed shame painful, personal, intense shame. Of course, we know that shame leads to the emotional consequences, and for Olivia, she felt trapped. She felt that everyone expected her to be a better mother, but she couldn't go back and change what had happened. She couldn't rewrite her history. She felt powerless because of that. In her own words, she already gave the disorder to her son. It was done. And she felt isolated. This was a new change in her family, and she was the first person in her family with this condition. She didn't feel like anybody could relate to her, and when she tried to reach out to a support community, it did not go well. Her pain was palpable, and we are going to leave Olivia and Malcolm here, and we're gonna come back to them at the end. But I think this highlights how painful and caustic shame can be for patients. And we're gonna to move to understanding resilience. And that's because before we can learn how to use and build resilience, we have to know what it is. And resiliency is the process of adapting to life's challenges. It's emotional and behavioral flexibility. It's being able to adjust to internal and external demands. Simply put, it's adapting and overcoming. You guys probably know by now, I am partial to um, definitions that sit well with me, and this is my favorite definition of resilience. Resilient individuals are a twig with a fresh green living core. When twisted out of shape, such a twig bends, but it does not break. Instead, it springs back and continues growing. Resiliency is the ability to spring back and keep growing. And one thing I love about resilience is that it can be fostered, it can be learned, it can be developed, it can be practiced. We can teach our brain resilience. 
we can begin to change our thought patterns with that concept of neuroplasticity. So to some degree, research is showing that neuroplasticity can even change the brain structure. We have the ability to prune our own thoughts. And I won't get too nerdy, but I think that's pretty darn cool. So let's learn how to build our toolbox of resilience. The different tools that we can use to combat guilt and shame head on. These are our tools. Normalizing, creating connection, utilizing self-compassion and mindfulness. Every single person in this room has experienced shame. So before we can take any further steps, we need to work on normalizing shame. Talking about shame, normalizing shame, allows us to open up and be comfortable talking about our experiences. And that is the first step to help you work through them. 90% of people have shame due, tra due to a traumatic event. Traumatic events can be anything from a rare disease diagnosis, losing a loved one and feeling responsible, and shame is universally difficult for us to talk about. I don't think anybody likes talking about the most painful self-identity. And that makes it so hard to work through. Not only is shame a normal experience, rare diseases as well. Collectively, we've learned this today, a rare disease is the most common. One out of every 10 people have a rare disorder. We also know that people with rare disorders have higher levels of shame, largely due to the both actual and perceived stigma that they receive, whether that's from communities, whether that's from healthcare workers. And so our first steps are to normalize this. And so speaking about our shame is the first step, even if that's internally. It begins to take power away from shame and gives us a sense of control, gives us the strength to move forward with these other steps. Speaking about our circumstances also reduces our feelings of stigma. And the fun part is that even if it doesn't actually reduce stigma, research shows us that our brain thinks it does, which I think is kind of fun because that's what matters, our lived experience. So if we feel like we're experiencing less stigma, that's gonna help us overall. Now this isn't easy to talk about, and so I've provided some activities that we're gonna do alone but together. And the first one is the very first page, a dialogue with myself. You can physically write this out or you can go through it in your head. And so as an example, I have obsessive compulsive disorder. It took me the first three decades of my life to get somewhat of a handle on it, and it has been my biggest source of shame. So for me, this might look like, Dear Kelly, I know you're feeling ashamed about your OCD. I know you feel like your brain is broken and that nobody can relate to you, but I am here to tell you, you should not feel ashamed of that. Remember that having these experiences is normal. The majority of Americans have a mental health disorder and you have the skills to overcome this. And so I'm gonna have you just take a few minutes here and go through this and create a dialogue with yourself to start normalizing your shame even in your own mind. Luckily, they provided pens.
goal for this is to give you something that you can say to yourself over and over, that you can start to prune your own thoughts and normalize this in your own brain. And we're not gonna do all of these activities today. Um, the next one, doodling about shame, is a really great way to help your the different parts of your brain connect and express your own shame in a way that words don't necessarily um, create. And so um, you are not gonna send me if you don't do that, but if you are interested in this, um, I wanted to provide a few things that you can take home with you. Um, maybe I was the only person here who actually liked homework, but for time, we are gonna move on to talking about our next tool, and that is building connections and creating a support structure. Shame thrives in isolation. We can actively fight shame by fostering connections. Sometimes it takes work to identify positive connections and support nets for ourselves. It's not an innate skill. It's something that we have to work on and build. But the payoff is worth it. When we feel valued and accepted, it can be very life-changing. When we experience empathy from others who feel that fully understand us in our experience, it allows us to start overcoming shame in new ways. And I love this quote, that shame thrives when we feel most alone, cut off, separate, and different from those closest to us. It happens in the gaps between people. When separation is removed or lessened, the feeling loses power over us. And I think that we saw this with Shannon's talk and how she gave examples of how connecting with the XLH network and meeting her support group, developing lifelong friends who could relate to her, was a powerful experience and inspiring since she's now the vice president. Um, not only that, but we know that for rare disease patients, support structures are even more important. This is a special area of interest highlighted by NORD, and that is because of the undisputable positive health outcomes associated with it. Having support structures for patients with rare disease allows them to share experiences and information. You can learn about clinical trials. You can learn about the latest research. It helps reduce stigma. When we're around people with similar experiences, we start to see it as a part of the normal tapestry of humanity instead of an outlier. It helps us to communicate better amongst our peers and healthcare providers and it increases how supported we feel, whether that's real or perceived. And because we're here, and we have already talked about support networks for ADO, um, we are not going to do any work on that, but I did give you some activities where you can go through and identify people in your life that could be beneficial for you. People in your life that you might wanna foster a deeper relationship with, and we are gonna go on to self-compassion and using that to help paint our narrative. Self-compassion is easiest to think of when we first think of compassion. And I'm sure when I say compassion, everybody has some sort of mental image or definition that comes to mind. Most people are able to um, sort of realize the very components of compassion. They're able to identify it as sorrow or empathy for the suffering of another person, but also the motivation to help mitigate that suffering. Self-compassion is extending that same level to the person less, least likely to receive it, yourself. It is the desire to reduce your own suffering and treat yourself with kindness to be non-judgmental in understanding of your own pain and seeing yourself as part of the larger experience of humanity. It has three components. 
self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. Generally, we do the worst job at extending kindness to ourselves. We have a tendency towards self-criticism that's pretty universal, and research shows us that it is even more true when we have a rare disorder. So self-kindness is choosing understanding and forgiveness for ourselves. Understanding that perfection is an unattainable goal, and obstacles are inevitable no matter who we are. It's choosing to cultivate our thoughts to those needs. Common humanity, the understanding that we all have shame, we all fail, we all make mistakes. But when we forget this, we feel isolated, we get tunnel vision, and we think that we are the only person with challenges and roadblocks. But those challenges and roadblocks are so much easier when you realize I'm not alone. Everybody is going through challenges or has been through a challenge. It puts our situation in context. And mindfulness, choosing non-judgment with our thoughts and emotions and not identifying with them. It's working to respond to our emotions with compassion, allowing us to identify our own shame and its triggers. And I think that this is pretty um, powerful of a statement. And so we are going to Look at this in ourselves a little bit more in depth, and it is the activity of practicing self-compassion statement. And this was by research done in 2011, and she is one of the most preeminent um, self-compassion researchers, and they have found that creating a mantra for yourself has profound effects on your ability to practice self-compassion. And so there's a self-made, so to speak, or a published mantra, which this is a moment of suffering. Suffering is a part of life. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself compassion I need. But research has found that if we create our own tailor-made statement, it is so much more powerful. Something that we have in our back pocket to use when we are feeling shame, when we are feeling negative thoughts towards ourselves. And so the first page has some ideas for you, some examples of mindful awareness statements, common sense of humanity statements, and statements about being kind to yourself. The second page has spaces for you to create your own, for you to work on developing your own mantra of self-compassion. And I'm going to give you a little bit more time with this, and I'm going to encourage you to really engage in this um, and see how it feels. When you start to change your thoughts, see how that feels. Initially, it's not comfortable. Some people think of the idea of, of neuroplasticity of if you cross your hands or fold your hands like you're going to pray, you automatically have a, um, a thumb that is on top. And if you try and do it the other way, it feels terrible. It's absolutely bizarre. And so if you start every time you fold your hands to do it the other way, it's going to feel absolutely terrible. It feels wrong for no reason other than your brain has learned to fold your hands one way. But if you keep doing that every day, after about a week, holding your hands the way you did it before becomes normal. You've pruned your thoughts, you've pruned new connections. And so if you engage in an activity like this and come up with a mantra to tell yourself, even if you don't necessarily inherently believe it, you're going to be pruning the connections to help your brain believe it. Hopefully that was motivating to engage in this. We'll see.
one more minute, so don't go over your time. Self-awareness is the capacity to see clearly and understand our own strengths, weaknesses, emotions, and values. And mindfulness allows for the cultivation of self-awareness. Mindfulness is a critical step to fully being able to authentically see ourselves. And so how is mindfulness and self-awareness Useful. Why do we want to use these tools? Well, first and foremost, it enables us to recognize our own shame, our own painful core beliefs about ourselves, and understand how we react to it. Understand the roots that it's grown in our lives and how they're impacting us day to day. It enables us to figure out in our daily life what triggers our shame, what triggers these deep, painful feelings, and how can we identify solutions? It allows us to accept these feelings with non-judgment, that they're a normal experience that everybody has. And we know that mindfulness techniques specifically reduce feelings of shame, anxiety, and depression. And so how can we work on assembling self-awareness? So it allows us to make space and to learn and explore our reactions and triggers. So what does shame feel like to us? What does it feel like emotionally? And what does it feel like physically? Is it like holding your breath too long? Is it tight knots in the shoulder? Do you feel it in your jaw? Is it a headache? What does it sound like? Is it like the constant ticking of a clock that never goes away, like Captain Hook and Peter Pan? Is it the low hum of a tea kettle in the background for you? What does it taste like? Is it bitter, like over-extracted coffee, or is it more the metallic twang of a penny? and understanding your triggers. How do you want people to look at you? What do you want them to think of you? Why? When they don't look at you that way, how do you feel? And these are really, really powerful tools. Um, and once we have self-awareness, we can enact real change. And we're gonna do one of my favorite activities, which is training your puppy to sit. Um, I find that this analogy sits very horribly with some people um, and well with others. And it's the idea that um, like a puppy who hasn't quite learned to sit, who is jumping around and erratic and just a little bit out of control, sometimes our brains can be the same way that we need to do some of that pruning and teach our brains. And so this is the start of training the puppy to identify the not enough messages we tell 
tell ourselves to sitting in some moments of mindfulness and creating an alternative message of self-acceptance. And so you see an example there, but there are plenty of others. Um, for example, for me, one of my not enough messages might be, I feel like I'm failing at everything today. I can't get myself in order. And my self-acceptance message might be, I know you have built the tools to overcome this. So I'll let you fill out a few of the messages that you tell yourself every day and how we can change those to be self-accepting. desire, you can continue practicing on your own a little bit. And so to bring this all home, we're going to check in with Olivia and Malcolm again. But a few notes. We have spent our entire lives developing our core shame identities. This is not going to change overnight. In Olivia and Malcolm's example, when I met with them, Initially, so when I met with him latest, it was two years. Another little asterisk here is mental health disorders can impact this. Never be hesitant to reach out to help, and counselors and mental health professionals are really experts in knowing you, what techniques work best for you, and if there's anything that's going to be need to be addressed first before we can dive into our shape. And we discussed four tools today, but I don't know if you have been into my dad's garage or Lowe's, but there are so many tools. Even just quick internet Google search and it's a little bit overwhelming. So everybody is unique and everybody has their own tools that work best for them. And so you can explore and find what works for you. Not everybody loves mindfulness. I have a friend and it makes her so anxious. It's not for her, she uses different tools. And so, um, a little encouraging that there are different ways to accomplish the same thing. And let's check in with Olivia and Malcolm now. Olivia normalized her experience by talking to new moms in new mom groups, like baby play groups, she learned that almost every new mom she interacted with felt like a failure to some degree. But that was completely normal. And she also realized after connecting with other support groups that it was normal for her to have a rare disease. 
that more people than we realize, whether it's a rare disease or cancer or dementia, have some sort of challenge to overcome. She started building connections. We worked to connect her with support groups that were able to provide her with the support she didn't get before, and more importantly, um, connect her with people with similar or the same disorders to realize that she wasn't alone and she could learn from those experiences. We also helped work in, edu worked in educating her spouse and her family so they could better understand her lived experience. We cultivated self-compassion. Creating relationships with people with the same disorder was so instrumental to her. It allowed her to look at herself in, her new, in a new light. These friends she had made, she would never look at them and say, you're a failure. You should have never had a child. And so why would she show that same level of unkindness to herself? It helped her understand her self-compassion in a new light. It also helped her understand common humanity. I'm not alone in my experience. There are other people going through the same thing or similar challenges. Ultimately, she started to understand a new narrative, that she believed that she had the ability to teach her son how to be a good advocate for himself in the healthcare industry, that she had the ability to teach her son resiliency, and that every single person has challenges, and this just happened to be one of their challenges. She and her husband decided to make some very positive changes and are actively trying for another child. She is pursuing yet another degree, one of her many, and she is able to do all of these things because of these new narratives she believes about herself. And so I hope that that helps you realize a little bit about how when we work through our shame, we can have really powerful, positive consequences as a result of that. And I want a special thanks to everyone who made this event happen, to Amy and Marion for meeting with me multiple times so I could better learn about ADO. For my partner Jeff, who came to see me speak, who knows very little about um, genetic disorders, but is so excited to learn. And I am very happy to take any questions.